Well, greetings, and thank you so much for tuning in today as we get ready to do a teaching on why the gospel is so important. We thank you so much for tuning in to Warriors for Jesus Ministry. And as we always say, Warriors for Jesus Ministry is a PowerPoint, bullet point teaching ministry that is designed not to just inform you, but believe God to transform you that you may live a saved and sanctified life. We want to go right into our lesson for today, our teaching for today, why the gospel is so important. Now, let's look at it from this point, from this perspective. Number one, the gospel is non-negotiable. Why is it non-negotiable? Just like the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1 and 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the gospel is not only non-negotiable, but we are not to be ashamed of representing Jesus as Lord and Savior. We should not be ashamed of letting people know that Jesus died and rose with all power in heaven and in earth in his name. We are professing and saying the gospel is real and it is powerful and we declare it because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. So the gospel is about salvation. It's about delivering. Delivering from what? From sin. It's about being set free from the habitual bondage of daily sin. The Apostle Paul defines the gospel this way. He says, for I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. So now this is a man that was a murderer. This is a man that approved of killing Christians, believers in Jesus. This is a man that had a religious standard, but yet was ignorant of the fact of who Jesus really was, who God really was, manifested in human flesh. But he came to the conclusion that for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now notice what he says, and he's speaking of the Old Testament. He's speaking of what all only what they had written at that time, and it was according to the scriptures that he was representing Jesus, God who was manifested in the flesh. And he was representing him according to how the scriptures foretold many years ago that he would come and that he would die and he would rise again on the third day and will be savior of the world. He said, I, according to sins, and I come to you professing him according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the word of God declared that Jesus would come alive and that he would be savior of the world. Now, for us to really get into the scriptorial clarification of that, it would just alter this whole video of what we are trying to convey to you at this present time about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, we understand that Paul said he's speaking this, he's believing this according to the scriptures, according to the word of God. So the gospel wasn't invented by Paul is what he's saying. I was reading a book, a book by a rabbi, and the title of the book was The Myth Maker. And, and, and he said that Paul had invented Christianity. And you know, a lot of uh, Jewish people have that idea. They think that Paul kind of got it messed up and invented Christianity. But he was talking about the Jewish Messiah that they should have known was coming that was prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. So it wasn't so much he was inventing Christianity. He was talking about salvation and holiness and sanctification, which we recognize as being Christianity. But he says, Romans 1 and 1, Paul says, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. God called him, caused him to be, to be spent three years with him in the supernatural realm, giving him revelation, giving him understanding, 
separated him, pulled him out from among those who was crucifying and who was persecuting God's people. God separated him from among those self-righteous religious leaders that the, the, the group of Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees that Paul was very familiar with. God separated him unto the gospel to represent Jesus as Lord and Savior. So Paul now is a servant. He's a bond servant. He's a slave for Jesus. And he said he's doing it. He separated him unto the gospel. And he said, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the scriptures. And remember what we say, how he said, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures. And so he now he, he's relating to these Jews who should understand that this is prophetic fulfillment right before them when he begins to let them know about this God who promised that he would manifest himself in human flesh and that he would die and he would rise on the third day, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, not in the philosophy book, not in the intellectual book of, of man's insight, but according to the revelation, the inspiring word that God moved up on the heart of men to record so that it can be fulfilled as the biblical truth of God's holy word. But he did it according to the Holy Scriptures. Paul is saying this is why he believed in God. I'm sure some of you that are listening heard people say, I got my own faith. If you begin to present the gospel, they get upset and say you are insulting their religion. You're, you're insulting my religion. Uh, the gospel is about getting saved. It's about getting delivered. It's about understanding that God can set you free from those habits of sins that are controlling your mind and controlling your life. Getting saved from what is the question that many perhaps should be asking, or maybe you should want to know, what am I getting saved from? Well, there was once a time uh, um, you were either saved, you were either delivered, you were either represented, having a new life. People knew that you was born again. People knew you were sanctified. You weren't smoking no more. You weren't drinking no more. You wasn't cursing anymore. You weren't doing the sinful, habitual things that you did like other people did anymore. And once there was a time you were either saved or you were lost. People recognized when you were a sanctified believer and they recognized when you was a sinner. And everybody knew who was saved. We, when you came into the church of God, you know, our spirits will bear witness with your spirit, rather it's be God. In other words, the Holy Spirit that God gives me and that he gives you, we can bear witness with it because the fruits, the life that you once lived is different. And we can also tell who wasn't saved, who wasn't delivered. And when we got saved, it was a big thing. There was great rejoicing. That's why we need to talk about because it is salvation and deliverance. The gospel is how you get saved. Back to the question. Get saved from what? Get saved from God's judgment. Get delivered from God's judgment. The judgment of God is coming soon and very soon. The judgment, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? God, what will be the outcome for them? Don't you know? Listen to what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's asking the Corinthian church this question because they were challenged with the philosophers and the false teachers and with the culture and with the paganism and with the, 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 um, the temple worship of prostitution and whoredom. And they were challenged with all of the different uh, things that was worshiped and celebrated in that time. And Paul brought the gospel to them and it caused many of them to be transformed according to the scriptures. And Paul asked the question and God is asking the question to the believers today. And to those that need to become not a believer by just saying you believe, but become a believer by living a life different from how you are living now. So I'm going to let the word speak for itself because I always say while you're reading the word, the word is reading you. Don't you know, Paul says, that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? He's asking that question. Do you not, uh, do not be deceived? 
This is what Jesus said over and over in the last chapter in the Gospel of Matthew. He warned the followers, be not deceived, take heed, be not deceived. Do not be deceived, nor sexually immoral people, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, or any practicing homosexual, homosexuality, no thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, will inherit God's kingdom. In other words, you need to be delivered from them, these sins, delivered from these willful habits. Now, now there's a willful sinning, and there is a sin that we, we will never be sinless because the only person that's sinless is Jesus. But we don't practice the habits of willful sins that we once lived once we do obey the scriptures, once we obey God's word. Because I always say we can still be rebellious, we can still be stubborn, we can still be unforgiving, we can still have an anger problem. Always in need of repentance and deliverance all the time. But the reality is once you surrender your life to Christ, receive God's spirit according to how Jesus left instructions with his apostles in the book of Acts, how the church got started. Please read it and follow just what he said to them and believe God for yourself to get it just like they got it and be emerged in water in the name of Jesus, just like you were instructed. You will be instructed in reading the book of Acts. God can deliver you from these willful habits of sin that will stop you from being saved, stop you from being delivered, stop you from becoming separated and sanctified and learning how to practice a life of holiness. So, Paul made it real plain to help the church understand and such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified. You have an opportunity now to start all over again in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. His spirit changes your life because all have sinned according to Romans 3 and 23 and come short of the glory of God. The word sin means Mr. Mark. The glory of God is everything that God represents. It's glorious. It shines. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's heavy. It, it carries a weight. Oh, his glory is heavy. It's strong. It's vibrant. And, and, and God's glory is everything that God represents and for which he stands. He stands for holiness, righteousness. But 1 Peter 4 and 17 says, and just like we said, save from what? From the judgment of God, which will come. And 1 Peter 4 and 17, the apostle Peter made it very plain. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be for them that obey not the gospel of God? He's asking the church this question. And he's asking those of you that are listening that are not a part of living a life to please God this question. Do you not understand that the judgment is going to start with God's church house? But the, with those that are living and professing to be genuine, sanctified believers and Christians, according to God's word, our judgment is coming. Our rewards is coming for our faithfulness or, or, or we're going to just uh, be in heaven, but we won't get no crowns. We, we, we won't get that, that kind of uh, reward that we should want for being a witness, for, for, for martyred, uh, for, for the elders, you know, just, just for the faithful crowns are going to be given. That's our judgment. That's, that's that white throne judgment. But, you know, I mean, the judgment seat. But then when you get to the white throne judgment, you are, you are, you're understanding that that's a judgment that's going to cost you eternal damnation. For the time will come that judgment must, we're saying it again, begin at the house of God. First begin at us. What shall the end be them that obey not the gospel? So the church is the bearer of light to the darkness. If the light of the world become dark, the darkness could become worse. But we are to be changed with our life so somebody can see that there is a better way to live even in this temporal world that we're living in. See, here's how it goes. When you look at the world, you have to look at 
what causes the world to function, what causes you to function in the world is not just, you don't just stay a baby. You don't just continue to lay on your back. You eventually learn how to roll. You eventually learn how to crawl. You eventually learn how to walk. You eventually learn how to talk. And then you grow up and you learn how to live and you do it in a body. And you exist in this world with a body. But then when we look at the soul, that's when we deal with the will, with the decisions that we make. Uh, if you don't understand God's purpose for your life, you're going to define your own purposes, not just your purpose, but you're going to define all different types of reasons why you should live the way we live. So you're dealing with the soul. Now you're dealing with the will. You're dealing with the mind and the emotions, the feelings. And all this functions through the body. But we can't see the will, the mind and the emotions. But we feel them and we react to them and we display how we feel about our emotions and we display what, what we think in our minds according to our will, according to how we perform it in our body. And then you have the spirit that's connected with the soul. And in the spirit realm, everything is invisible. And this is where the divinity of God came in there. He had to house himself in flesh. He had to house himself in the body so that we can see how we are to be able to be delivered from our mind, our emotions through the spirit realm, through the realm of our inner man. We can't understand how computers build. We can't understand how it functions, but we know that when it's programmable and when it's put together, it's operational and we're able to see it with our physical eyes as it functions for us. But yet we don't understand in the invisible parts that's put inside of that, that motherboard and that hard drive, but we know it's there and everything is properly connected. It's just like a body, soul, and spirit. So we have to understand what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. The spirit is what we are. The body is the house the spirit dwells in. So this is why Paul said, do you not know that your body, he's talking to the believers now. So that means we just can't do anything with our bodies. We just can't make our bodies look any kind of way because the culture does. We just cannot uh, uh, appear any kind of way with our bodies. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom ye have received from God? He's asking that question. You are not your own. You were brought with a price. You were brought at a price. And that price was Jesus dying on Calvary's cross being crucified for the sins of the world. Therefore, honor God with your body. But the only way we can honor God with our body, we're really honoring God in our spirit because now he has transferred his spirit inside of us through genuine repentance and allowing him to fill us with his spirit. Like I say, when you read the book of Acts, you'll understand how that happens because if I keep saying through the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you're not going to understand me, but you read it, you pray it, you believe it, and you can receive it. So therefore, we honor God with our bodies through the spirit of God. And this is what we become, this is how we become new. So the Holy Spirit uh, is like information from the word of God that gives us direct revelation to our mind. And your soul and your spirit, in other words, you choose to think and speak and act on God's thoughts. This is why the word of God is so important for you to discipline your physical body to be able to relax and read. Because once you do that, the information from God's word while you're reading it, it's reading you. It gets down in your soul, down in your spirit. And then you can choose to think and act on God's thoughts. How do we get God's thoughts? Through his word. Because he inspired man to write what he wanted us to apply to our life. So now your body, uh, you regulate information from the senses of your body, which goes about in the natural physical world. That's what people see. They see us in the natural physical world. But God sees us in the spiritual realm because he wants to deal with our emotions, with our will, with our soul, with our spirit, so that we can display the life of holiness. We can display the life of glory for him. We can show what he wants us to represent and how he wants us to represent him. So the Holy Spirit, the body, and the soul, they all link together to transform us into walking in a new life. But unfortunately, just as Paul said to the Galatians, God is saying to us, uh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh. 
Why is that? So you have the flesh and you have the spirit. Remember the body, the world. Remember the soul, the will, the mind, the emotions. And remember the, the spirit. We understand the spirit is the invisible realm. The spirit is the inner man. And even those of us that are fighting not to do the willful sinning, even those of us that are fighting to learn how to trust God, have faith in God, discipline ourselves to prayer, discipline ourselves to studying God's word, discipline ourselves to witnessing and declaring and testifying about the glory of God. It's always a fight in our human mind because your mind, your will does not want to submit to God's will and God's spirit. But Jesus said, not my will, but I will be done. Jesus even said the flesh is weak. In other words, he was fighting in his humanity. And though he had a divine, supernatural spirit, he was fighting in his humanity to show us we're going to have the same kind of battle. But he said the flesh is weak, but the spirit indeed is willing. And even though he, 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 he saw that suffering, and he was kind of crying out for it not to really happen, yet at the same time, he knew that the will of God, the spirit that lived inside of the son of man, the God man was greater than the son of man because the son of man was manifested to show us how to live in this body, but yet understand that we are soul and spirit. So it's always a battle for they, for these are in opposition. They are opposition, they're opposed to one another so that you may do the things that you please. See, this man, the flesh, wants to please and, and obey how he wants to live and please himself. But this man, the spirit man, understands that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So we have to understand exactly how and who's more important. Now look at what Jesus said. He said, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now we read to you who would not inherit the kingdom of God. You can go back and you can look at this recording. This is a bullet point PowerPoint teacher ministry for you to go back and look at again. He said, but fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now this is Jesus saying this. This is recorded in his holy word. So our fear of man, uh, our fear of man is unfounded simply because he can uh, do just so much to you. But our fear should be of God who can send you to a burning hell. So one of the biggest fears in our society today is fear of our own government. People fear the government. They fear um, uh, on tax debts. They fear uh, or, or their mortgage is not paid. They fear they might lose their home. You know, they fear the government. When the government say this is forbidden and that's forbidden, they obey him. They fear the government and particularly from the IRS. But we are to fear God, not fear him as if we're afraid his judgment is going to kill us at any time, but fear him to the point of where I reverence him, I honor him, I want to obey him, I want to submit to him, I want to be his servant, I want to be his slave. Otherwise, you do need to fear him for his judgment, his wrath that can come upon you if you don't be saved, if you don't get delivered, his judgment is coming upon you. So Hebrews 10 and 5 say, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, sacrifice and offering thy would is not, but a body has thy prepared me. So that was prophetic. And that was coming all the way from the book of Psalms. And it was repeated all the way in the book of Hebrews because it was showing us that God prepared a body so that he can be a sacrifice for us. So behold, all questions. It said the mysteries of godliness is great. God was what? Manifested in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit. He was seen of angels. He was preaching to the Gentiles. He was believed on to the world. He was received up into glory. This is why is important. 90% of the time, the things we fear never happen. Besides, fear is the opposite of faith. And it is displeasing to God. Fear of God could be classified as, like I said, respect. I respect my parents. I would never curse around my parents, never drink around my parents. Well, I don't even drink, but I'm saying when I when I did. 
I respect my parents. I never called them by their first name because I had that kind of respect for them. So I respect them according to demonstrating in my body through uh, demonstrating in my mind that I'm aware of who they are. They're my parents. So it's the same way with God. I respect him because in his body, it belongs to him. Every day I wake up, it's because this is a day which he has made and I rejoice and I'm glad in it. So I respect him. I honor him enough to learn how to please my father. So the soul is not the same as the spirit. The soul is our mind, our emotions, our will, our personality. But the spirit is our capacity to relate to God. The soul, the person goes into an internal, eternal state, either heaven or hell. The body will ultimately go there as well. That's why Jesus said, fear him that's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Revelations 2 and 12 say, and I saw the dead and small, great, standing before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which was the book of life. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they would judge each one of them according to what they had done. Isn't that plain? See, that's why I say while you're reading the word, the word is reading you. So that shows you no matter how we say we shouldn't judge, God is going to judge us. And he expects for us to warn those that do not believe that they need to be delivered the way he instructs. And that they do need to be cleansed from those habits of sins like we read in the book of Corinthians. Because you will be judged, each one of them, according to what they have done. We'll be judged according to every deed done in our bodies. So we must stand before God in a judicial sense as guilty or not guilty. Condemn prisoners before the bar of a divine justice. The dead are those who are spiritually dead because of their rejection of Christ. They will stand in their resurrected state before Jesus to be judged by him. Books. These books record every thought, word, and deed sinful men are recorded by divine omniscience, the all-knowing God. But there is nothing, Jesus said, that is covered that shall not be revealed, and neither hid that shall not be. So until next time, we thank you so much for tuning in to Warriors for Jesus. And I hope you understand why the gospel is important. God bless you until next time.